Okay, so this evening we're going to be looking at Perkei um, Avos, Ethics of the Fathers, uh, Mishnah, uh, Chapter 5, Mishnah Number 5. Um, I, I chose this, this Mishnah, specifically this evening, because it deals with um, the Beis Hamikdash, the Holy Temple. And since uh, we are uh, beginning, we're entering, it's not nighttime yet, but uh, we're getting towards night and we are entering into the 17th day of Tammuz. And on Shiva Asa Tammuz, it is a uh, one of the fasts that are, is connected to the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash of the Holy Temple, which was destroyed on the ninth day of Av. But uh, on Shiva Asabatamas, on the 17th day of the month of Tamas, amongst other things, um, one of the things that happened was that the walls of Jerusalem were, were breached. During the Second Temple era, the walls of Jerusalem were breached and ultimately it led to the destruction of the Holy Temple. It's a fast that begins early in the morning, um, before 6 a.m. and uh, uh, and it finishes at nightfall. And, um, and so we're going to look at this Mishnah since it's very apropos for us to get into the um, picture of what we're missing. We, we are thousands of years since the destruction of the Holy Temple and we mourn its destruction but uh, learning about the Beis Hamidosh is one of the ways that we can increase our yearning for its rebuilding when we realize what it is that we are missing. And that's why during these three weeks, during the three week period that starts this evening and ends on Tisha B'Av, the three weeks that mark the morning of the destruction of the Holy Temple, one of the things that we should be doing is learning about the Beis HaMikdash, learning about the Holy Temple. And in the Pirkei Avos, in Ethics of the Fathers, in this Mishnah from the fifth chapter and the fifth Mishnah, we learn as follows. Asara Nisim Nasu Labasenu Bebeis HaMikdash, 10 miracles were wrought for our fathers, for our forefathers in the holy temple. And what were these 10 miracles? No woman miscarried because of the aroma of the holy offerings, of the meat of the holy offerings. And the meat of the holy offerings never went bad. It never went off. And no fly was seen in the slaughterhouse. And no bodily impurity befell the high priest on Yom Kippur, Velochibu Hagashamim Eish Shal Atse Hamarocha, the rains never extinguished the fire on the wood pile on the altar. Velonitzcha Harua Ches Amut Ashan, the wind didn't prevail over the column of smoke. Velonimsa Pisel the Omer, and there was never anything that disqualified. That was that was a defect found in the Omer offering of Halechem or Belechem upon him, or in the two uh, loaves that were brought on Shavuos, or 
in the showbread. Um, the worshippers, the eighth thing is the worshippers stood packed together, yet prostrated with ample space. No serpent or scorpion caused harm in Jerusalem. And no man ever said to his fellow, no person ever said to another, the, the place is too crowded for me to lodge in Jerusalem. So we're going to take a look at these miracles and get uh, uh, somewhat of a picture of the great revelation of godliness that took place during the temple era. And the purpose of each of these miracles, what do they have in common, these 10 miracles, is that each of these miracles was wrought by God so that no harm should come to anybody because of the base Hamidash, because of the holy temple. And it ranges from the most difficult thing that could happen, from the most severe harm that could cause, which is God forbid that, that a woman should, should lose a baby that she is carrying to the uh, to the least, which is where a person would say that uh, that there's no place for me to stay, and right, and that should be the worst thing that ever happens to to a person. And as we're going to go through each of these miracles and understand the the miracle so we have a question here uh why did they think why did they think it was possible a woman would miscarry was their basis in other cultures this happened so we're gonna we're gonna address that um why it would be possible for a woman to miscarry many reasons actually um but the main reason that is um, that is brought over here is that um, is that we know that when a, a woman is carrying and when she's with child, sometimes she can have a craving for something. And if she craves that thing and doesn't get it in a timely manner, God forbid, it could cause, the uh the woman to miscarry to lose uh to lose the child and um and we know that in the base amigdash in the holy temple there were many sacrifices that were brought um in the base amigdash in the holy temple and um, if you can just imagine for a moment the aroma of an amazing barbecue taking place and, uh, and out of the thousands and thousands of people coming to the holy temple, it never happened that a woman craved this uh this sacrifice and because of that it would cause her to to god forbid to miscarry um now first and foremost important for us to understand that purkei avas ethics of the fathers is a a, a book of morals it's a book here it's not it's not here as a halacha book as as law these are teachings above and beyond the letter of the law and it's also not a history lesson so as we're going to go through 
the, this Mishnah, this this Mishnah of, uh, of ethics of the fathers, Mishnah number five, one of the things that we're going to learn from here is that everything, every miracle that Hashem brought about was to, to make sure that no harm ever fell upon anybody because of the Beit HaMikdash, because of the Holy Temple, whether it was physical harm, whether it was emotional harm, whether it was dignity. And we know that when it comes to the concept of miracles, generally speaking, Hashem likes to work through natural means and only does a miracle, which is something above and beyond nature, when it's absolutely necessary. So one of the lessons that we are going to learn this evening is that when it comes to preventing harm to another person, we must do whatever it takes. We must go above and beyond. We, we, we see that Hashem himself did this, even though generally Hashem only likes to do a miracle when absolutely necessary. So we take um, a message from Hashem that we, will, we, we should do whatever it takes to prevent harm from befalling another person, whether it's physical harm, whether it's emotional harm, whatever it might be, we should emulate HaKadosh Baruch Hu. we should emulate God who brought these 10 miracles for this very reason. Now, it's interesting that of all the miracles, the first miracle that is mentioned over here is Lo Hipila Isha Mirech Basaha Kodesh, that a pregnant woman never miscarried because of the smell of the, uh, the cooking meat. And this is a miracle that not every person who came to the Holy Temple really um, benefited from. If you think about it, if you think about percentage-wise of people that came to the Beis Amigdash, came to the Holy Temple, it's really a small minority of people that would fall under the category of, uh, of being a woman who is carrying a child. And yet we see that Hashem was willing to go above and beyond the norm even for the sake of the, the individual, that we should never say it's too much trouble to go to whatever it might be because it's only for a few people or it's only for an individual. But, uh, uh, but we, should, we should take the lead from Hashem who did this miracle for, for those who were maybe in the minority, but nevertheless, um, the miracle was deemed important by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It was deemed important by Hashem. And, um, and why did Hashem do this? Because Hashem didn't want even one individual not to want to come to the Beis HaMikdash, not to want to come to the Holy Temple. And he was prepared to do whatever it took, in this case, to, to, to bring about a miraculous event so that even the minority of people would not, uh, would not be held back, would not stop themselves coming to the Beis Amidosh, to the Holy Temple, even if it was just for a limited period of time. 
and um and 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 it's important it's a very very important lesson for us um the second miracle, which is an amazing miracle, if we think about it, the meat of the holy offerings never went bad. I mean, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of sacrifices taking place in an open environment, in an era where there was no refrigeration, no, uh, um, uh, no preservatives, not the kind of uh environment that we have today and never ever did the holy meat become um bad it's it, it's it's an obvious and open miracle i mean I, I i i think everybody here can think of a time where they uh, either bought meat from a store that was off or it was fine when they bought it, but it was left too long and it went bad, whatever the case is, to be able to say that in the holy temple where there was a constant flow of carbonus of sacrifices, which uh, consisted of meat, not one ever went bad. And, uh, and of course we can understand the harm that would come about if it were it, many things that could cause harm from meat that is off from meat that is that is bad and hashem did not want any negative impact um certainly not an unpleasant smell to be there certainly not a a god forbid uh, any kind of uh food poisoning to take place because of the holy offerings and the same as we come to the third miracle no fly was seen in the slaughterhouse imagine uh, uh, imagine a slaughterhouse where not a single fly was ever it's it, it's an impossible situation there were there there, there were animals there livestock and that there should never be a single fly found. And we all know that flies, besides the unpleasantness, flies carry um, carry bacteria and diseases. And, and Hashem made sure that there was never a, uh, a fly in the slaughterhouse. The fourth... Um, the fourth miracle is no bodily impurity befell the high priest on Yom Kippur. Now, if, if the high priest were not to be present to do the service, everybody would understand that, uh, th that he was not in a fit state to do that service. And um, God wrought this miracle to protect the dignity of the Kohen Gadol of the, of the high priest. Um, the fifth miracle, the rains did not extinguish the fire on the wood pile on the altar. Now we're talking about an open area and rain falling yet it, it, it never put out the fire. There's no question about it. This is only because Hashem, the one who created rain with the ability to extinguish fire, in this situation, so decreed that the rain should not extinguish the fire on the wood pile. And, um, and imagine, imagine being in a place to behold such a miracle, to, to be in a place where you could see that the laws of nature, that nature, that, that nature is not uh, being followed in such a place. And that was the holy temple. That was, 
that was the base Hamikdash, where one would go and would openly see the, the presence of Hashem. There's a beautiful explanation also given on this miracle. The rains did not extinguish the fire on the wood pile on the altar. A homiletical interpretation is that rain alludes to the torrent of material concerns that flood our minds and hearts and that we shouldn't allow this rain to extinguish our fire for, for Torah, our engagement in the study of Torah, which is compared to fire. So just as God, we know, God does things in a way of measure for measure, that, uh, that he rewards us measure for measure, so too, we should look at things like this and do the same for Hashem, do the same for God. What was the sixth miracle we said? The wind didn't prevail over the column of smoke. Okay, imagine, imagine you have a fire outdoors. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's an open campfire under the sky and it's a little bit windy. So what happens to the smoke? It gets scattered. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's a natural response to the wind that the wind will scatter the smoke. Now in the base amygdash, um, the smoke that came up from the, uh, from the altar was a holy smoke. And therefore, the, um, the, the wind had no power over the smoke. And you could see this clearly. If you were there, you would clearly see this pillar, this column of smoke going straight up to Shamayim, going straight up to the heavens. And it, with all the wind that was there, it, uh, it, 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 it never blew the smoke, not to the right and not to the left. Um, the Midrash Shmuel gives us a very beautiful lesson from this miracle that the powerful wind could not prevail over the seemingly vulnerable and insubstantial smoke because the smoke was holy, right? What would you say if you were there? Holy smokes, right? So what do we learn from this? This teaches us that we can have weakness. We can be weak like smoke. But if we connect ourselves to the holiness of Torah, and mitzvahs, then all the winds from around us will not be able to prevail. And, and, and this is a very important lesson for us over here. Um, now, the, the, the column, we, we just said, that uh, the column of smoke, so the column of smoke also, there's another explanation. The column of smoke alludes to our innate connection to Hashem and Yiddishkeit. And where did we get that from? Where did we get, we said it's an innate connection. Where did we receive that connection? We received it at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai. And if you remember, we said that when Hashem gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, the mountain was enveloped in smoke. So wind, we talk about the winds of time. Wind alludes to the winds of time. Um, the various isms that seem formidably compelling and threaten to drive us away from our gold, godly roots, chas v'shalom. So the Mishnah assures us that even if we're driven off track from time to time, the wind can never completely prevail over the column of smoke, which is the immutable connection to Hashem 
that we internalized at Har Sinai. And that's a really important thing for us to remember because sometimes the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, doesn't want us to remember that. The evil inclination would rather we look at ourselves and say, forget it. You're a lost case, chas v'shalom. But here the Mishnah comes to tell us, no, there's no such thing as a lost case. Yes, maybe from time to time there can be a little veering to the right and to or to the left, God forbid, but the wind will never, ever be able to prevail over the column of smoke because that's a connection that is God-given. That's something that we, all of us, received at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai. Um, the seventh miracle we said was there was never anything to disqualify, no disqualifying defect in the Omer offering. What was the Omer offering? The Omer offering consisted of barley. It was brought from the second day of Pesach. And um, the barley had to be harvested from the new crop the night before it was brought. However, they would only harvest the exact amount that they needed, which was the Omer. That's what, that's what it was. And therefore, if anything went wrong, they had a problem because they couldn't get any more because it had to be brought on that day and it had to be brought from the crop that was harvested the night before and they only harvested the exact amount that they needed. And therefore, it was really a great miracle that it never became ritually impure. And after this offering was brought, after the Omer offering was completed, then the grain from the new season was permitted. And... Um, and those people who lived close to Yerushalayim would know that the Omer offering was good. But what about those people who lived far away? And so Hashem brought about this miracle so that those who lived far away from Yerushalayim should never come to eat from a crop that was forbidden to them. So again, the Omer offering was what permitted the new crop to be eaten. And if that Omer offering became disqualified, then the new crop would be forbidden. So Hashem brought about this miracle to make sure that nobody would come to sin. Nobody would come to eat from the crop that would be forbidden. So it's, we can understand that we should act this way as well in our lives. We should go that extra mile to make sure that nobody does wrong because of something that we could have prevented. Um, And the same is true about the loaves, and the same is true about, about the showbread. This same concept, the same idea. Now we go to the eighth miracle. This is an unbelievable miracle. The, they're all amazing and unbelievable miracles. And think about, think about being, coming to this place, coming to the base of Migdash, coming to the Holy Temple and experiencing such overt presence of our Kodesh Baruch Hu, of Hashem in a physical place. So the eighth thing is that the worshippers stood packed together, yet prostrated with ample space. You know, 
during the service in the Holy Temple, when it came to modim, to, to, to mishtachavim, to bowing down, um, the way people bowed down was to literally spread their bodies uh, along the ground. Imagine being in a packed stadium or a, or a, a, a packed train. I don't know if anybody here has ever been to 770 during Yom Tov time where everybody is literally squished and packed together. Uh, I recently, somebody recently sent a, um, a video of, uh, actually, I don't know. Yeah, I think it was in Asia somewhere of the people in rush hour getting onto the train and how they would be like packed in like sardines where you would not think anybody could enter. And then there were like three or four more people coming along and they would squash them in. in and that was accepted practice. The conductors even would come along and make sure that the shoes of the people and the, and the, and the noses, I guess, were in safely so the doors could shut. So imagine being... In, in, in such close quarters, that's how it was in the Beis Amikdash, in the Holy Temple, thousands and thousands of Jews coming to, to, to the Beis Amikdash, to the Holy Temple, where the Torah tells us we should come to see and be seen. And then having to bow down. How, how are you going to do that? How is that going to come? Uh, how are they going to be able to do that? So it was a miracle. It was a miracle that the Jewish people were physical people taking up space and yet at the same time didn't take up space at this point when it was time to worship. Um, and and, and, and it, the description that we just gave, it says, Omdim Tzafufim. That they were standing tsufufim. Tsufufim means packed together. So packed together that they were floating. If you ask my husband, he can tell you when he was in 770 that sometimes he was literally floating. His feet were not touching the ground. That's how many people there, uh, there were over there and yet each person was able now why did Hashem do this miracle why couldn't the, the people just have bowed their heads or why did Hashem bring about this miracle and the sages tell us that the reason is because what one of the things they were doing when they were prostrating themselves and bowing down to Hashem is they were confessing their averas they were confessing their sins. And Hashem did not want that a person should have wanted to come because he would be embarrassed that the person had their ears literally next to their mouths when they were confessing, when they were confessing their sin. And um and and that's why when the Kohen said the name of Hashem and all the people prostrated themselves and bowed down, why? To protect the privacy and the dignity of another person. Something that we all should learn from, absolutely. Um, there's another beautiful explanation that the Rebbe gives on this idea where the worshippers stood packed together yet prostrated with ample space. We spoke about this actually. It's amazing how everything ties in together. We spoke about this this morning in our class when we were learning the Parsha this week. Um, and, and, and what's the lesson? The lesson is that if when Jewish people gather together, each one stands straight up, unbending, egotistical, making no room for the other person, then all the space in the world will not be enough for that person. But when a person prostrates himself, when a person 
puts the ego aside and becomes humble, then all of a sudden there is ample space. And this is the lesson that we can learn from this miracle that happened in the holy temple, in the holy base Hamikdash. Um, the ninth miracle we said was no serpent or scorpion caused harm in Jerusalem, even though that's a region of the world where it could be, but God did away with any possibility that harm should come. Nobody should say, I don't want to go there. I'm afraid. I'm allergic. God forbid something could happen. And what, what's the last thing? The last miracle is no person ever said the space is too crowded for me to lodge overnight in Jerusalem. Now notice the Mishnah doesn't say that the place was not crowded. The Mishnah says no person ever said the place is too crowded. So what does that mean? That means that Yerushalayim was crowded, but Hashem made a miracle that when we came to Yerushalayim, when we came to Jerusalem, everybody felt a special relief that God provided Hashem did not want for a person to say about the beloved Yerushalayim, I don't want to go there. It's too stuffed. It's too packed. So that's why the Mishnah tells us the miracle wasn't that Yerushalayim wasn't packed. It was packed. It was crowded. The miracle was that the people who were there didn't feel that they were all packed into a confined space. They didn't feel that they were that they were crowded. And the truth is, the previous miracle that we mentioned earlier about the Jewish people having space to bow down, earlier on, they were okay being packed in like sardines. It was only when they were about to to first of all, to prostrate themselves, second of all, to say their sins, to confess their sins, that the miracle needed to, to occur. And when that was needed, Hashem caused the miracle to take place. And not only that, not only did the guests not feel that Yerushalayim was too crowded. The miracle was even for the residents of, the, of, of Yerushalayim, that the residents never said, let me get out of here. I don't want to be here at this point in time. Hashem provided this miracle for every single Jew, whether they lived in Yerushalayim, whether they visited Yerushalayim, this was a miracle that Hashem provided for, for them. And sometimes people stayed in Yerushalayim for long periods of time. So the, because they would come from a very far, far place. And let's say somebody wanted to be there for Shavuos and they came for Pesach, sometimes they wouldn't go home. They would stay for the seven weeks. So this was an ongoing miracle as long as it was needed, Hashem provided this miracle. So we have here two things, more than two things, many things that we learn from this Mishnah. A most important thing is that when it comes to caring about another person, whether it's their physical health, whether it's their emotional health, whether it's their dignity, what, whether it's their, their, their mental health, whatever it might be, 
we should be like Hashem and we should go above and beyond the norm. And if we will be that way, then surely Hashem will be the same for us. He will do the same for us. Also, as we approach Shiva Asa Batamas, the 17th day of Thomas, where we begin the three week mourning period for the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, we should A, resolve to learn as much as we can about the Holy Temple. Because after all, how can we mourn for something if we don't really know what it is that we are missing? And B, when we learn about the Holy Temple, when we learn about the service in the Holy Temple, Hashem considers it as if we are carrying out that holy service. And, and, and thirdly, the more we learn and the, the more we understand the greatness of the Holy Temple, the more we will yearn in earnest. And really, that's what these three weeks are all about. That the three weeks of mourning for the Beis Hamikdash, for the Holy Temple, are here to spur us on to feel the urgency to an even greater degree to do whatever it is in our power to bring about the revelation that we just talked about in the holy temple, in the holy city of Yerushalayim, and that actually the entire world should be privileged to see the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the presence of God in this world. And that's what these three weeks are all about. Now we'll continue into Mishnah number six. Asara Devarim, Nivra Uba Erev Shabbos Bein Hashmashas. Ten things were created on the eve of Shabbos at twilight. So we're talking about during the six days of creation, we go look into the Torah, we see that God created the world in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. Now, Bein Hashmashas, in English, we call Bein Hashmashas twilight. It's between the two lights, the two suns, right? Between the, 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 the light that was light during the day and the light at night. There's a period of time, twilight, where, uh, where in Jewish law, one day has not yet ended, yet the night is really already beginning. And the very first Bein Hashmashas, the very first twilight that ever was, meaning the first Friday of creation, had within it two, uh, two elements. The first element was the element of Friday, which was one of the days of creation, a day of creation and nature. And then it also had within it the element of Shabbos. And the element of Shabbos is the opposite. It's a day of rest and transcendence from nature. And therefore, during that time, God continued to create. Why? Because it was still Friday. And what's Friday? Friday is a day of creation. But because of the specific time period that the creation was taking place, which was Bain Hashmashas, which was a time of transcendence of nature, that's why those things that were created during these times 
were of a very special quality. Because on the one hand, it was still Friday, it was still creation, but on the other hand, it was already Shabbos, rest and transcending nature. And so we're going to go through all these 10 things, which we're going to see were, uh, were miraculous things that were created within nature, within the world. And, um, and what were these things? What were these things? So the first thing was P Haaretz, the mouth of the earth. What is that? What is the mouth of the earth? A couple of weeks ago, uh, a few weeks ago, more than a couple, we read in the Torah the story of Korach. When Korach came to rebel against Moshe Rabbeinu, which ultimately means he came to rebel against Hashem, the Torah tells us that the ground, which naturally speaking is, uh, it is a solid surface, but a miracle happened and the earth had a mouth. It opened its mouth to swallow Korach and all of his followers. So that mouth of the earth was created on Friday afternoon, Bain Hashmashas, at that period of time. What was the second thing that was created? Pi Haba'er, the mouth of the well. Which well are we talking about? We're talking about the well of Miriam. It was the well that was provided for the Jewish people during the um, travel in the desert for 40 years, where did they get water? So they received water in a very miraculous way with this well of Miriam that traveled along with the Jewish people. And whenever they stopped and traveled, uh, stopped their travels, the well of water would spring forth and all the Jews in the desert would have what to drink. So this is not a normal situation. This is a miraculous situation. And it was created on this first Erev Shabbos Bein Hashmashas during the twilight uh, time. Um, by the way, um, you may realize this already. This is where the idea of the twilight zone comes from, where things are not quite the way they usually are. Uh, what was the next thing created? Also from last week's parsha, Pi Ha'asan, the mouth of the talking donkey. So when something like that happens, think about it, this is something that was created thousands of years before and uh, a two and a half thousand years, the donkey is waiting to speak, is waiting to say its piece. Normally a donkey cannot speak, but here Hashem created the ability for the donkey to speak. And that was when it was created on this first Erev Shabbos. Um, what's the fourth thing? The rainbow that appeared after the flood that was created on this first Erev Shabbos. And um, yes, we can talk about how a rainbow comes about and we can explain it scientifically but the rainbow that Hashem showed to, to, to Noah after the flood, that rainbow was created on this first Erev Shabbos. Um, the Haman and the manna, which also we've been talking about in these parshios, normally 
food grows in the ground, when the Jews were going through the desert, they received their food from the heaven. The truth is, even the food that grows in the ground is from heaven. Everything is from heaven. But the way in which it was received was very different to the way we receive food on a regular basis today. What else was created during that time? By the way, each one of these parts of creation, we could spend an entire class on each one on its own. Um, we're just in the surface over here. Um, the Hamate and the staff of Moses, we know in the, in the story, in the Torah that we recount when the Jewish people were in Mitzrayim in Egypt, where Moshe Rabbeinu did miracles with his staff and in the desert, that staff was something that uh, was not available on Amazon or anywhere else. This was a specific staff that had been created specifically for this purpose. And we know that there were many miracles that were brought about through this staff. And that's why it was created during this time, Ben Hashemoshes, on Erev Shabbos, the first Erev Shabbos. The Hashamir and the worm. Which worm are we talking about? In order to build the Beis Amikdash, in order to build the Holy Temple, this Shamir, this worm was needed. It would have been impossible for the temple to be built without this worm. So what is this worm? The shamir is a worm that has the ability to cut through stone, to gnaw, to eat through and cut stone. There is a halacha, there is a law that on the temple mount in the holy Beis Amikdash, since the Beis Amikdash, its whole purpose is life and bracha and blessing, it was forbidden to cut the stones for the temple. It was forbidden to bring the, uh, the, the tool to cut those stones with metal. They were not allowed to be made um, through cutting with metal. So how, how are we gonna be able to create a Beis Amikdash, a holy temple, if we're not allowed to use metal to cut through the stone. And so Hashem created this worm, the Shamir worm. There's a beautiful, the, the, you can read the Medrash, you can Google it. Um, the Shamir, S-H-A-M-I-R. Make sure you go to a kosher place to see it, Chabad.org or, or uh, Aish, wherever it might be. But uh, beautiful um story about this shamir and how it was brought to the holy temple in order to be able to build god's house of life without using any weaponry which is exactly the opposite of life oh we had a question here so hashem knew there would be a flood hashem knows everything. He knew you were going to ask this question, Yechebed. Hashem knew that there would be a flood, yes. God knew that there would be a flood. God knows everything. Um, and anything and everything that is needed for every, every part of life, no matter what period of history it will be, has already been thought of. So if you're worried about COVID-19, it's understandable. <laughs> I get that, but remember this, God knows everything and everything that's needed for this period of time and this journey and for us to be able to move forward to greater and higher places, Hashem, has thought of it. Um, 
So the Shamir that split the stones for the Holy Temple. Number eight, the, uh, the form of the letters of the Luchos, of the tablets, which, by the way, one of the calamities that took place on Shiva Osaba Tammuz on the 17th day of Tammuz was that those first Luchos, those first um, uh, tablets, were smashed on the 17th day of Tammuz. Everything is interconnected. And, um, and we see already that this day, the 17th of Tammuz, was a time of great disaster and sadness already when we were traveling in the desert. And um, the form of the letters of the tablets, the engraving of the tablets, and the tablets themselves. And some add the burial place of Moses also was created then. And the ram of Abraham, our father. And others add that the spirits of destruction were also created during that time as well as tongs, tongs. Why? Because tongs are made with tongs and therefore there needed to be a pair of tongs. But that's another subject on its own. So I want to wish everybody um, to have a meaningful Shiva Asa Batamas. I want to remind everybody that um, nobody should, and this is coming from the Rabbanim, the rabbis, nobody who has any issues with fasting, or even if they don't usually have issues with fasting, but have any kind of health issues going on now, should put themselves in a position to weaken themselves, because we know that we're living through a difficult time through this, um, through this virus, and, um, and therefore, one should not fast unless one is certain that it's not a hazardous to their health. And, um, and if a person is, is uncertain as to whether this uh, PSAC, whether this ruling applies to them, very simple, just call up your Rav and ask. But if it's, if it's very obvious, you don't even need to ask the question. It doesn't mean that the day cannot be a meaningful day we have the custom, as I mentioned this morning, that if one is not fasting, they should give to tzedakah the equivalent of the meals that they're eating on the fast day. And certainly it should be a day of additional prayer, additional charity, additional Torah study, specifically connecting to the, uh, the laws of the Beis Amikdash, of the Holy Temple, and, um, and the surrounding uh, historical facts of the destruction of the, of the Holy Temple. And of course, the idea being that it should evoke in us the emotions and the yearning for the rebuilding of the Beis Hamikdash. it should be speedily in our days.